Good evening. In our first two lectures, we've looked first at the origins and nature of postmodernism, and uh, then last evening we tried to look a little more specifically at the implications of postmodernism for historical study and historical understanding. And in case any of you are new this evening, I just want to review very, very quickly uh, how we define postmodernism because tonight I'm going to proceed and just keep using that term. And it is a rather uh, broad term, but let me just uh, say very quickly what um, I'm thinking of when I say that. It is uh, the broad umbrella term covering a range of movements that uh, share the quality of uh, being dissatisfied in certain ways with the Enlightenment tradition what's often called the modern tradition. And some of these dissatisfactions uh, would emerge uh, as they want to challenge several of the things that they believe are fundamental to, fundamental to the Enlightenment tradition. And I'll just list a few of these. First of all, the idea that reason is the defining feature of human beings. Uh, that would be the first. Second, that reason and the methods of science are really the only accepted methods of knowing or of justifying claims that are to be counted as truth claims. Uh, another tenet of the Enlightenment tradition that is uh, of concern to postmodernists is this idea that all of the world is moving on this inevitable trajectory of progress toward the liberation of the autonomous individual. And usually, at least in the 18th century, that was always put in terms of liberating the individual from tyranny and superstition. Uh, and that usually included uh, religion and um, at least religion that wasn't defined by reason. Um, and then in addition to the idea of reason, uh, reason as the defining characteristic of humans, reason and science as the way of knowing, uh, the idea of progress, the final uh, tenet of the Enlightenment that really is being questioned in very significant ways now is this idea that, that these truth claims are of universal applicability. The idea that um, where truth is, uh, wherever truth is, it will be the same. And this idea that wherever we look, in whatever cultures, in whatever time, in whatever um, uh, class, in whatever categories we're talking about, uh, truth will have universal application. And so this idea that what we're aiming for is uh, what is universal. Tonight and tomorrow, I'd like us to engage in reflective evaluation of postmodernism, what I described that first night as, as weighing, trying to, to discern what is helpful, what is not helpful. And tonight I'd like us to look at postmodernism appreciatively. Um, I'm reminded of a quote that uh, really comes from Austin Fair, and he made the statement that it's not until we look at something appreciatively that we can see what's there. And so I'd like us to, again, if we have reservations about postmodernism, to step back and at least try to understand uh, what is attractive to many people about this uh, and to, to see appreciatively. And then tomorrow I want to come back and look at it critically. I'm choosing this order deliberately, and maybe if I knew my audience better I would uh, not do this, but most of the circles that I've been in, with the exception of very small pockets of academia, uh, the tendency is to pounce rather quickly on the problems of postmodernism. Uh, as I say, the tendency, I think, of most uh, people, um, at least circles that I've moved in, and again, maybe, maybe I don't know this audience very well, but I, I think there's often a tendency uh, to, to pounce very, very quickly on the uh, claims of postmodernism. And before that happens, I want us to make a sustained effort, again, to look appreciatively at the insights of the postmodern movement. And I'd like to group these appreciative reflections under three uh, general categories. And I'm really, I'm really um, wanting to, as I say, uh, make three affirmations here. First of all, that we should not be surprised by the claims of postmodernism. Uh, second, I'll group another set of reflections under the category, we should not be disappointed by the questions of postmodernism. And then the third, I'll group under uh, another category, we should not be afraid of postmodernism. So with those three categories, uh, I'll begin our reflections tonight. Uh, first of all, I don't think we should be surprised by postmodernism. I'm guessing that all of us here tonight would like to think of ourselves as thoughtful, reflective, self-critical, morally sensitive uh, human beings. And as we look at our own experience, we should all be well aware of human frailty. Um, 
I'm remembered, reminded here of a, of a comment that G.K. Chesterton made in his book on orthodoxy, and he says one of the big surprises to him about the Enlightenment is its belief in human progress, and he says the uh, Christian doctrine of the fall seems to be the one theological doctrine that can be established empirically. Um, and so um, I, I think as we look at our own experience, whether we would define ourselves as Christians or, or just as decent human beings, we should be well aware of human frailty, of our inability to see clearly and fully, of our tendency to see narrowly and to be short-sighted, of our inability to say exactly what we mean. I mean, in almost any conversation, if we really, really want to understand someone, we have to pass the language back and forth several times in order to be clear. Um, I think if we're really honest about ourselves, we have to uh, be open to the fact that often we're willing to use truth for private agendas rather than serving it. And sometimes that's intentional, sometimes it isn't. I would guess that most often it's not intentional. And then I think any of us that have operated in the academic community or in the church, and I would guess that that would include uh, with those two categories, most of us here tonight, um, I think we have to be aware of the way that power concerns creep so insidiously into discussions that are supposedly about truth. I mean, if you really think about it, the academy and the church are two of the institutions in our society that you know, most talk about uh, getting at the truth, uh, and yet how many of us have been involved in discussions, heated discussions, uh, where we've been tempted to put our desire to be right ahead of our desire to get at truth, and if we haven't seen that tendency in ourselves, I'm sure we've seen it in other people, and perhaps we're more aware of it in other people than we are in ourselves. So all I'm saying here is that at least if we're really reflective and self-critical, I think we have to say that, that um, at least part of what postmoderns are saying in calling into question uh, the kind of claims of, of the possibility of objectivity, uh, the claims of seeing clearly that we have, to, again, we, we, those of us who look honestly at the human condition, I think have to be really struck by uh, the ways in which we are frail beings. And then I would suggest another aspect of this not being surprised is I don't think we really need Hegel or Marx to, to, to um, realize that every reality sooner or later gives rise to its opposite or its antithesis. We see this in generations of families or we see it in the church. Over the past two decades, many of my friends who've come out of the low church tradition have moved in the direction of Anglicanism or in the states Episcopalianism or Catholicism. But if I were a betting person, I would bet that many of their children, 20 or 30 years down the road, will be moving back in the direction of low church to find out what they've missed there. So again, in this area, as well as in many other areas, we see that element of generational conflict or dialogue. Um, I would suggest that in the middle of the Enlightenment itself, at the very high point of these affirmations of the Enlightenment, there came David Hume, who after having been steeped in the tradition of logic and having grown up hearing the praises of reason, came to see as clearly as any 20th century postmodern the limitations of reason. He came to believe that our most fundamental convictions about the world could not be established by reason alone. And most of you are probably aware of Hume's uh, challenging the idea that we could know by reason um, our basic beliefs such as the existence of the external world, uh, our belief in cause and effect. Uh, in fact, at the end of book one of Hume's treatise, after exploring the nature of human understanding, what we would call reason, Hume makes this very interesting and, and somewhat um, uh, pathetic in the sense of full of pathos claim. He says, methinks I am like a man who having struck on many shoals and having narrowly escaped shipwreck in passing a small firth, has yet the temerity to put out to sea in the same leaky, weather-beaten vessel, and even carries his ambition so far as to think of compassing the globe under these disadvantageous circumstances. My memory of past errors and perplexities makes me diffident for the future. The wretched condition, weakness, and disorder of the faculties I must employ in my inquiries increase my apprehensions and the impossibility of amending or correcting these faculties reduces me almost to despair. So just as Hume's self-conscious study of reason in the 18th century led him finally to see the limitations of reason more clearly even than its possibilities, so many in the 20th century who have been brought up amidst the confidence in reason and the methods of science and human objectivity have come to see the boundaries beyond which reason and science 
seem unable to go. So, both as observers of history, where we see the proverbial pendulum swing back and forth in all areas of thinking and practice, and as morally sensitive people who want to be honest about how far we fall short of what we know we ought to be and want to be, I would say we should not be surprised by many of the concerns of postmodernism. And they're pointing up our limitations, the limitations of reason, our frailties, our bentness, or as the Christian tradition would say, our fallenness. Even more than that we should not be surprised, I would suggest that we should not be disappointed by these questions and concerns of postmodernism. We might take as a model here those uh, modern historians, uh, and I'm going to, to mention a number here, who've written a book called Telling the Truth About History. And this is written by Margaret Jacob, Joyce Appleby, Lynn Hunt. These are names that some of you in history might recognize. Um, and in their telling the truth about history, they've argued that the questions and attitudes of postmodernism, rather than being disappointing, should be welcomed. These questions can, according to these historians, actually help us to do better what we've been trying to do all along, that is, to get at truth, in their case, about history. But I think we can apply this all around. According to these historians, uh, according to these historians, historians have every reason to continue their enterprise of critical scholarship, of seeking truth about the past, and of striving for objectivity. The concerns of postmodernism may make us more careful in our work and more conscious of our limitations, but they need not change our fundamental understanding of the historian's task. For according to this approach, it is the very seeking and striving after truth and a place of objectivity, not the achievement of these ideals, that has characterized the historian's task. It is these ideals that, has elic that has, have elicited confidence in the value of the historian's task, and it is the results of the activities done in the name of these ideals that have made historical study valuable as a weapon in the pursuit of social justice and redress of past grievances. It is the results of historical study pursued according to the rules of modern critical scholarship that have exposed past injustices and that have occasioned rethinking of our memories in ways that have enabled us to imagine new possibilities for the future. It has brought us about the exposure of past injustice in such a way that has served as a catalyst for change in the present. Now, ultimately, as you can tell, these historians defend a modern vision, but the point is that the questions that the postmoderns are raising are, are actually helpful in a kind of self-correcting way of the modern historical tradition. They're glad to be challenged. They're glad to seek out new voices and new perspectives, again, for a fuller understanding of the historical tradition. And again, I think we could add uh, that in other areas as well. I would suggest that it's not only within, within the historical profession that the insights of postmodernism can be helpful, and it's not only in the getting to truth that postmodern questions can be helpful. I want to suggest that to anyone who wants to advocate anything, whether it's a particular position on the environment or the virtues of an academic discipline or a particular faith position, Postmodernism calls us to certain sensitivities that can help us to do better what we've been wanting to do all along, that is to witness to truth claims in a way that they can be heard. The modern framework, according to many people, champions argument as a model of advocacy, champions argument, confrontation, a sort of win-lose model of, of discourse. Uh, Mary Midgley, who I wouldn't characterize as a postmodernist, but she's writing and she, in her book, um, Knowledge of Information and Wonder, she argues that ever since Descartes, we in the modern tradition have been trained in dialogue to operate from a skeptical stance, to look first at what is wrong in a position rather than at what is right. And she says the effect of this is then to shut down dialogue. Um, she's not saying, by the way, that we should not be concerned about the point of disagreement, but rather that we're more likely to bring people to see more clearly, perhaps, their shortcomings by drawing them out in areas where we feel they've spoken truth rather than by shutting them down. And then, of course, her point is also that we'll learn more by focusing on what is being said that we think is right than simply by focusing on scoring a point by showing where the other person is wrong. Um, I think postmodernism does call us to humility about human reason and about our own sense of rightness. Even if we believe we're right, we're perhaps not obviously right. 
I think postmodernism calls us to greater recognition of the need to give people space to come to see for themselves. I think of a book a few years ago uh, that talked about teaching as hospitality. That is, creating space and inviting people to come to new ideas rather than simply uh, grabbing on everything they say that's wrong. Um, now, I do want to say here, because I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm over-romanticizing uh, postmoderns. I've run into postmoderns who, while they're very critical of argumentation and confrontation in the modern tradition, actually function very much the same way. So I, I'm not, again, wanting to, to romanticize the postmoderns here, but I would certainly say that moderns are not always true to their own convictions either. So I simply want to say that postmoderns do call us to a different kind of, of discourse, a discourse that is more humble, and I would say that part of exercising this humility is being more careful in the ways that we handle what we believe to be true in dealing with others. And here I want to just pause and have us reflect together a little bit, and I want to um, mention some names of people that have really helped me to appreciate this point. Um, and again, none of these people would be people who would call themselves postmoderns, but I'm saying they emphasize this idea of the importance of humility in discourse. Uh, one of the pensées of Pascal uh, goes something like this. He says, no one wants to be told that they're all wrong, but no one minds being told that he doesn't have all of the truth. And you think about the different model of discourse that we would have if instead of showing that someone is wrong in a very adversarial way, we talked about, well, um, but have you also noticed this? As Pascal talks about in his Ponce, we set um, another uh, aspect of the truth alongside what someone is claiming. Um, Iris Murdoch, in The Sovereignty of Good, applies a principle from this. She said, if someone is really committed to something, a person or a position, you're not going to change them by attacking that commitment directly. You have to offer them a new object of attention. And so again, this idea of, of not perpetuating this adversarial model, this power model that has tended to characterize uh, modernist discussion, this idea of going for what is wrong, uh, first, rather than focusing out it and creating space for people to come to see more clearly. Uh, Murdoch talks again about giving people new objects of attention. And then at a much more um, uh, down-home level, I remember a long time ago when I was very young, um, asking my father, and I guess this was when I was much more maybe legalistic in my own thinking and had a much more black and white view of the world, um, uh, I asked my father why he never preached against things. And I remember he said to me, because of course I was wondering, I should stop here and say, I, I was wondering, I said, well, you know, Dad, there's certain things you don't believe in, but you don't seem to ever preach against things. You always seem to preach for things. And he said, um, he said, well, you know, Shirley, I try to operate according to the principle, and this is what he said, uh, the expulsive power of a new affection. Well, I've sim uh, since come to learn that that's actually an old sermon title from, I think, a Scottish preacher. Um, but the phrase has always stuck in my mind, and I think that that model would fit very much within, uh, again, what the postmodernist is challenging in the modern tradition, that we don't try to argue people where they're wrong, we try to show them something true, something uh, positive to believe in. We try to draw people to true things, and again, at least according to my father's theology, the false things fa uh, give way. Now, I don't know if we've found that all to be true, but I think the principle is at least, least worth probing. So, postmodernism calls us to humility regarding our own use of human reason and to recognize the limitations of argument and, and, and or trying to get people to change simply by confronting them adversarially at the cognitive level. Now, again, let me pause here and say something. I know some postmoderns who just think that argument and actual direct uh, uh, discourse that is in the category of debate just should go out the window. I, I'm not arguing that. I don't think that's true. But I do think that perhaps um, as we're thinking about advocacy for any position, maybe the model of debate and, and, and going for uh, the jugular, going for where we think the other person is wrong, um, again, may not always work, may not always be the most effective. And again, I think what postmodernism calls us to is a wider range of reflection about uh, ways of, of advocating um, that give people space to come to see differently, a more hospitable model of dialogue and discourse. Postmodernism reminds us that the context out of which people come shape their way of looking at the world, and if we want to speak to them, we must first listen, hear their voice, find out where they are located, um, which would be a good postmodern expression. Perhaps we have been too enlightened, enlightenment in our sense that humans are basically the same. 
The postmoderns would call us to listen before we speak. And again, I want to draw an illustration here. Um, postmoderns, um, no, no, actually, I don't, I don't want to say that. Um, I think the Enlightenment um, has certainly raised lots of good questions about uh, church history. But one of the things that I've always been struck by in the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus is how very different is his language and approach to each person that he meets. And again, whatever criticism we have of the way the church has been dogmatic or perhaps um, arrogant in its approach at different times, um, it, it is something that when you read through the Gospels, however, however you understand the Gospels, wherever your own personal commitments are, I think it is very interesting that the model that Jesus operates with is trying to see people, where people are coming from. And his encounters with people are very different. Um, not the kind of model that so often um, we've perpetuated uh, in the church where we, we sort of assume that everybody's the same sometimes. Postmodernism calls us to recognize that everyone is not hurting in the same way. Everyone is not feeling the pain of the universe simply as individuals, which is something that is recognized within the modern framework, or as human beings, but also as members of groups. And again, postmodernism has called us to justice concerns often that are linked to groups, uh, sometimes in gender terms, sometimes in class terms, sometimes in terms of ethnic uh, categories. Postmodernism calls us to greater sensitivity to concerns of justice that often get in the way of people being able to be concerned about truth, particularly the concerns of justice that are linked to groups that have been viewed to be marginalized within the modern framework. And again, it's not that the modern world does not care about justice, but the modern world or the Enlightenment tradition has been most articulate and effective in arguing for the concerns of justice that are linked to human rights or individual rights. And when you think about it, the language of the Enlightenment is usually framed in terms of, again, individual rights or human rights, not so much emphasis on uh, groups. Postmodernism calls our attention to aspects of justice that are linked, again, to particular cultures or systems larger than individuals but smaller than humanity. So, postmodernism offers insights that help us to do better the jobs that we've been seeking to do all along. Uh, the job of seeking clarity and insight about the world. Postmodernism calls us here to hear from many different voices. Um, as we seek to be advocates for particular positions, whether they be, again, moral issues or, uh, or any kind of environmental questions, although I guess you could call environmental questions a kind of moral question, um, but any kind of advocacy, I think postmodernism calls us to a model that is more inviting and hospitable rather than adversarial. And then, um, as we seek to bring justice in the world, to have a sense of where people are hurting. And again, let me stop and make one aside here. I do think that as um, postmoderns, or those who would call themselves postmoderns, and those who would consider themselves moderns, as, as we try to find language that we can talk together in, I do think the justice categories are more uh, likely to lead to meeting points than truth language. I know, I know when I've been in discussions, um, uh, some very intense discussions actually, uh, where there would be people who would be coming very, con very consciously from a postmodern perspective, um, the language of truth tends to just stop dialogue, often. Now again, uh, maybe your experience of that has been different, but often um, I've been in discussions where, again, if someone makes a truth claim, the idea is, well, well that's your truth. And it, it isn't something that invites the dialogue to go further, it tends to, to stop it. But um, I, I do think that, that, again, justice, the language of justice or the concerns of justice are a meeting point that both moderns and postmoderns care about very, very much. And there may be some opportunities for dialogue that we might uh, probe there. So, as I say, I think that the justice language can be very helpful, um, a helpful meeting place for moderns and postmoderns. But then I will go on and say it's not simply that the insights of postmodernism help us to do better what moderns have been trying to do all along. In addition, I would argue that we should welcome the ways in which the insights and attitudes of postmoderns make space for a more whole vision of human beings than was available within the modern framework. I, I do believe that, again, whatever our experience or whatever your experience has been of, 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 of people who've actually called themselves whatever kinds of postmoderns, I think whatever that experience, I think the, the positions, the arguments of the postmodern position call us to a more holistic view of human beings. Human beings are not simply rational agents. They are also feeling and willing agents. And again, it's not that, it's not that um, the modern uh, 
world would deny that. But the modern world has tended to focus on reason as the defining characteristic of, of human beings, what they share. Postmoderns would call us to realize that humans are not simply reasoning beings or objects to be studied with the methods of Francis Bacon. Postmodernism calls us to look again to see in humans creatures who are shaped by their history, by their family, creatures who feel, who will. Postmodernism permits, even invites, a deeper understanding of what it means to be human. Again, to be human is not simply to be a reasoner, but to be someone who lives in community, someone who loves, someone who feels, someone who has a history. Now, I think I would want to go back and say, well, I think you can find all that within certain uh, strains of the modern tradition. But I do think, again, that postmodernism, even if you consider yourself a modern, postmodernism calls our attention to those things, those aspects of humanness, in ways that perhaps the Enlightenment often tended to forget. Uh, second, Postmodernism, in arguing that reason and science are not the only guides to truth, I believe creates, at least theoretically, at the place, a place at the table of discussion for voices of faith in uh, the, the modern world. It's legitimate in a postmodern framework to witness to one's faith in a richer and more nuanced way than it was in the Enlightenment framework. Um, and what I mean is this, the Enlightenment modern framework allowed truth to be legitimate or truth claims to be legitimate or claims to have truth value only if they could be justified in terms of reason. And so, for example, in the Enlightenment period, those who wanted to defend faith, um, and in Europe at least it usually was the Christian faith, would write books like Christianity Not Mysterious, or uh, you think of Kant's religion within the limits of reason alone. Um, and so the sense in the Enlightenment framework is that uh, religion, to be making truth claims, really has to meet those categories of, of reason. And I think postmodernism at least invites the idea that stories of faith um, can enter into the public discourse um, a bit more broadly. Postmodernism permits the telling of all stories, grounded in personal testimony, grounded in communities, grounded in traditions. The stories are legitimate as stories simply because they're part of human experience. Finally, postmodernism invites, I believe, a more holistic understanding of truth. And again, I'd like to just pause here and have us reflect a bit about this. In the postmodern framework, truth is not simply propositions about what is out there, abstract, disconnected from experience. Um, truth, for the postmodern, is what passes for truth in your life. That is, so-called truth is what connects to you. It is personal. It's concrete. Uh, truth is not truth for you within the postmodern framework until you are shaped by it or until it changes your life. Postmodernism calls us to recognize that being people of truth is not simply a matter of mental assent to certain propositions. It's also a matter of how we apply truth, of having clear moral vision, of using truth in ways that are morally responsible and careful and respectful of other people. And again, I think from our own experience, we all know people who believe that they have the truth, and maybe we would even say they have truth. Um, but the truth seems for them very abstract. It doesn't seem to live in them. And so perhaps they have affirmations that you would agree with propositionally, but it doesn't seem to change them. Um, I know an area, and I'll, I'll try to speak of an area that I have some connection with so that no one thinks, that, again, I'm stepping on someone else's toes where I'm not willing to step on my own. But I know sometimes when I've been in discussions with um, people in other disciplines, they've asked me why I want to go into philosophy. And um, I like philosophy, and I think it has a lot of wonderful things to offer to the world, and I, I really have appreciated some ways in which it's, it's helped me to grow, and I'm very thankful for it. But the stereotype, at least among a lot of, um, of disciplines, is the idea that philosophers um, just have these abstract discussions that are out there, not connected with the real world. And, and I, I know a philosophy colleague who um, probably um, would have many positions that would be agreed on by, by most of, of the other uh, faculty at our institution. Um, in fact, he's someone who would be very convinced that you can argue rationalistically for the Christian faith and that uh, reason can um, get you to uh, Christian faith. It's not just permitting Christian faith rationally, but can actually get you there. And yet he's someone that has a reputation for being absolutely insensitive to people. And, and somehow the truth doesn't seem to come alive in this person. At least that's the feeling a lot of people have. 
And it, it contributes to this idea. I mean, it doesn't help the reputation of philosophy. And it doesn't particularly help the reputation of, of Christianity. So I'm saying that I think even with our, in our own experience, we have this sense that, that really being people of truth is more than just assenting, again, to truth in the abstract. It, it's, about, it's about something that has to have an impact in our lives. And again, though we might not like the way that postmodernists would frame it, we, we can identify, I think, and appreciate what they're saying when they say, well, no, um, truth isn't truth unless it passes for truth. I mean, it has to have currency. It has to, it has to work in people's lives. I'll come at this in another way by, by changing the illustration a little bit. I mean, one of the questions, for example, that um, we think about, um, at least in the Christian tradition, is this whole idea of, does God exist? I mean, asking the question in the abstract, does God exist? And there's been lots of arguments throughout the history of philosophy in uh, trying to establish uh, arguments for God. Does God exist? Trying to uh, decide if, if out there we can establish rationally that God exists. But see, I think a postmodern would want to say, and I would want to say, I think we can appreciate this, that the question, does God exist, is pretty abstract until it becomes something that matters in our lives. And I guess I would want to say, if there is a God, surely he cares more than simply that we believe that he exists. Perhaps the more important question would be, do we want him to exist? Uh, does it matter to us that he, that he exists? Do we want to be people who would want to be in his presence? Um, I mean, in other words, all I'm saying there is I think that, that it's easy in our theology, in our uh, discussion about truth, to be very abstract and, and to have the idea that, that uh, again, truth is just a matter about having the right position on things rather than being a certain kind of people. And again, if you bring this illustration about, um, that I use in terms of God's existence down to your own uh, uh, personal interaction with other people, um, if you have, uh, I mean, if you, were, if you were raising the question about, uh, you know, a, a human loved one, certainly we don't care whether the people that we love care that we exist. We care whether they want us to exist. I mean, that's the more important question in terms of, of, our, of our lives. So, in other words, uh, the truth questions are richer and deeper, I think, than often we acknowledge uh, when we treat them simply as matters of abstraction. And again, I think that uh, postmodernists call us to the idea that, that uh, what really counts as true is what moves us, what motivates us. It's what is connected to who we are. It's not simply what we cognitively or abstractly consent to that is true. So, I've said here that we should not only not be surprised by postmodernism, but we should also not be disappointed. The insights of postmodernism can help us to do better what we've been wanting to do all along. To seek truth, to advocate things that we believe to be true, to seek justice, to seek personal wholeness. I believe that the insights of postmodernism can invite us to a deeper understanding of human beings, I believe that they can invite us uh, to uh, tell more complete stories of personal faith um, and perhaps to witness to all kinds of human experience that differs from the mainstream of what uh, perhaps is considered typical of, of, of our culture. And then finally, postmodernism invites us to a more fully nuanced understanding of the nature of truth and what it means to be people who care about truth and who care about integrity. Finally, I would like to suggest that as we confront the insights of postmodernism, we should not be afraid. And actually, maybe you're not afraid, and, and I, I'm only saying this because I think that often, at least when, when moderns um, do hear about postmodernism, it's very scary to them. Um, and so as I say, if you're not afraid, then this point is not for you. But, but I want to mention that I, I don't think we need to be afraid. I've already said quite a bit that could be applied to this point, and I don't want to repeat myself here. But um, I would just go back to um, uh, perhaps the notion of Gamaliel in the New Testament. You know, if, if what is being said is helpful um, uh, and, and, and if it's useful, let's take it. If it does not ring true, we'll assume that it will be um, stamped out. It will not bear the test of time. Um, and if it's true, we don't want to be standing in the way of it. Um, I would also recall here a, a point that's been made by Meryl Westfall, who's a philosopher theologian, uh, sort of person who's actually worked a lot with the insights of postmodernism and argued that often um, 
we fail to appreciate that any new social critique can point to ways in which the present system is failing. And I think he calls us then, it's just one more way of, of, of uh, making the point that I've been making here, that if what is being said in postmodernism is helpful and true, then we don't want to stand in the way of it. Uh, perhaps it can be helpful as a critique for us of seeing ways in which the modern categories or the enlightenment categories have failed to be fully satisfying to people and fully helpful as people have sought to be fully human in the world. I would suggest then that the task of the morally sensitive person in encountering postmodernism is to listen, to try to understand what is being said, to try to understand why people are drawn to it, or what blindness in our present way of thinking it is challenging. The task is first to wait, to submit, to forego the temptation to run too quickly to discount and to undercut the postmodern critique of the modern world. At the very least, and this is really a more pragmatic point I'm going to make right here, at the very least, responding too quickly and too defensively will simply confirm all the stereotypes of the modern thinker that the postmodern is challenging. So the postmodern vision then is not something to be shocked or surprised at, nor is it something that we should lament nor is it something to be feared. It is shaking up many of the categories of the modern world, the modern academy, and the modern world that we've become used to. And it's shaking it up um, in ways that, that um, as I say, make many people uncomfortable. But I would suggest that there's the opportunity here, if we're clear enough about how we are to negotiate this space, that if still not entirely comfortable, is a bit more spacious for uh, a wide range of human experience, for accommodating and appreciating a broader vision of what it means to be fully human, and for appreciating a broader understanding of the nature of truth. So, those are my comments about an appreciative look at postmodernism, and uh, tomorrow night I'm going to be uh, coming at it from the other side and inviting us to take a more critical stance, um, and really what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that I think uh, there's a lot to be said on both sides. And um, I'm hoping that, um, not that you'll conclude that all of tonight is true and all of tomorrow night is not true, or vice versa, but rather that these can be points that will help you in your weighing of the various issues involved in postmodernism. <laughs>